Good afternoon, everybody. I think we can go ahead and get started. We're here at uh, 1.30 p.m. Central Time. So let's go ahead and kick this off because we've got a lot of really great content and some excellent speakers here. So we're excited to get into this focused trade mission preview to Costa Rica and Guatemala. All right, so um, I'm just gonna start off with a little bit of information uh, quick about food export. Um, so Food Export Midwest and Food Export Northeast are nonprofit international trade associations. Um, we're made up of the different state departments of agriculture and ag promotion agencies around the 13 Midwest and Northeast, state, Northeast states. Um, and we promote the export of Midwest and Northeast food and agricultural products. Um, so we provide this support through a few different ways, um, including one which would be trade missions that gives US companies the opportunity to travel abroad to meet qualified international buyers in uh, foreign markets. And that's exactly what we're going to discuss today, a couple of back-to-back um, -back trade mission opportunities that we have coming up in 2024. So we're really fortunate this afternoon to have um, four of our in-market representatives joining us here on this call. Our in-market representatives are our food industry experts. They're, they're kind of our boots on the ground who are located in these key markets around the world. And they are our food industry experts who set up the one-on-one -on -one meetings between our U.S. companies and the local buyers in their countries. So we're really excited and fortunate today. We have Tatiana Kuros and Daniela Prado joining us, representing Costa Rica. And we have Debbie Corrado and Francisco Marcucci here representing Guatemala. So, um, like I said, we've got a lot of really great content. We're excited to share this with you. Um, so without any further ado, I'm actually going to go ahead and just pass it on over to Tatiana and Daniela to get us started talking about Costa Rica first. I hope you're doing fine. My name is Tatiana Quiroz. I'm, I'm the in-market rep for Costa Rica, Panama, and Nicaragua. And Daniela, who's here with me, is a our main assistant for Food Export Northeast and Midwest, and she is going to do the presentation for you, and we will have answers and questions, questions and answers at the end. Good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to, to see you this morning, and thank you very much for the interest in participating in our upcoming Focus Trade Mission to Costa Rica. Uh, we will start if you want, Paul, the, the next slide. Yes. Thank you. And, With and a country Danielle. overview, oh, the capital Danielle. of Costa Rica is San Jose. The population is around uh, five, two point million. Um, and the GDP, 71.25 billion for 2023. And the GDP per capita, it's almost $14,000. And we are um, doing a forecast of GDP growth of 2.8 to 3% for 2024. 20, uh, the currency is the Costa Rican Cologne and the exchange rate is one US dollar. It's uh, the same as 535 colones, 535 colones. Our uh, language is the Spanish and um, Costa Rica at this time, it is considered an upper middle income country. Uh, we are currently ranked in number 83 of the major economies in the world. And we are recognized uh, for our focus on sustainability, renewable energy, and responsible tourism. Foreign investment and tourism are two main economic drivers too. One, One of the, of the good, good things, things is that Costa Rica Colón is going down, I will say, where dollars are going down and Costa Rica Colón is going up. And then it's a very good opportunity for importers and exporters to do business because of the exchange rate. And actually, it's going down a little this week. It went to 520 or 523 and today 200, 520. So it's it's a good opportunity because dollars are not as high as they used to be. 
So it's a great opportunity for you to do business in this country. Thank you. Uh, market opportunities, as Tatiana said, um, the exchange rate. And also we can mention that we have the CAFTA, the Central America, Dominican Republic, United States Free Trade Agreement. Uh, this agreement took effect in Costa Rica on 2009, and it immediately eliminated tariffs of 80% of U.S. products. So it's a, a very good opportunity uh, for our markets. Uh, also, Costa Rica has eliminated its tariff on substitute, I'm sorry, that word substitute substantially all um, U.S. agricultural products. And this is very important because Costa Rica is scheduled to eliminate remaining tariffs on chicken leg quarters on 2000, the, the last year, and for certain race and dairy products by 2025. So it will be a, a very good opportunity for, for this kind of products. There is a phase out and and phase out in many products and and those are going to be on 225 so that's a really good opportunity also not just dairy but pork and rice and and many others that were very very uh, i will say well we produce some of them so it was really delicate a really delicate issue for costa rica but now you know, we're, we're become very competitive and, and it's going to be a good opportunity also to know that those tariffs, instead of 60%, are going down almost to zero, some of them. Uh, next slide, <clears throat> please. <clears throat> the U.S. exports of consumer-oriented food and beverage products to Costa Rica reached a record high of four, uh, 20 million in calendar year on 2022. We have here a list of the top and consumer oriented agricultural imports. And um, you can see that we have uh, pet food, we have poultry products, dairy products, beef products, food preparations, bakery goods, cereals and pasta, condiments and sauces, beer, tree nuts, and wine. That this table you can see those are the main imports. However, not the best prospects. We will see the best prospects on other slides. Next slide, please. Talking about the retail sector, <clears throat> um, continues to growth uh, with an increasing number of modern supermarkets, stocking a growing range of imported products. Many consumers are turning to private label uh, products in response to economic and pricing pressures, while more affluent consumers have shown a steady interest in premium imported products. Um, Costa Rica's retail sector consists of supermarkets, hypermarkets, mini markets, warehouse stores, and approximately two, uh, 22,000 mom and pops shops. And one important thing here is that after uh, COVID, you know, the the there's more conscious on how to stay healthy. So many premium imported products are still very, uh, they're looking for a lot of those. So it's still very important for them to find them, especially in the U.S. In Costa Rica, when you said U.S., it's a... It's, uh, it's the meaning of U.S. products or U.S. origin is good quality, good quality products. So that's very positive for U.S. Uh, products because, you know, that's how consumers relate uh, U.S. products with quality all the time. And even though consumers are price sensitive, uh, you know, and, and they want bulk formats, there's still room for for a retail and and not a private branded a products actually there is there's the top 10 retailers there and from those 10 retailers the 10 major retailers in Costa Rica because there's more and as Daniela said there's 22 thousand mom and pop stores from those retailers we there is a, a total of 460 retail stores 
So it's a lot of, of, of retail stores where you can be at. And, and as you know, Walmart is huge everywhere. And, and just Walmart has like 287 itself. And there's two, two or three others that are oriented only to high ends. Next slide, please. Now talking about the food service sector, um, it's important to mention that tourism uh, the demand and dynamic food service operators in the San Jose metropolitan area continue to generate strong export opportunities for U.S. suppliers. A mm -hmm. steadily rising standard of living, a young population, the growth of modern HRI outlets, and the increasing diversification of Costa Rican consumers' collective palate are expected to sustain demand for imported food products in the years ahead. A uh, quick service restaurant, high end restaurants, as well as larger hotels and resorts purchase their food and beverage through local importers. And specialty ingredients and products are regularly imported from the United States. The food service sector is divided into commercial and non commercial subsectors. Uh, the commercial food service subsector includes quick service restaurants, full service restaurants, cafeterias and drinking establishments representing 70% of the total food service sales. And the non-commercial subsector, mainly driven by the tourism industry, includes hotels and motels, healthcare facilities, universities, and schools, as well as grocery retailers offering hot preparated foods for dine-in or to-go. Next slide, please. Um, this is... Um, very important information that uh, we we wanted to share with you about the distribution channels here in our country. So you can see for the domestic products, um, the local food producer, then the national product, wholesaler, food service, consumer, distributor, all local retailer. In case of importer uh, products, um, we'll start with the exporter, then the freight forwarder, customs broker, uh, the importer distributor, and then that uh, distributor goes to the food service or retail, the, the end consumer. When when we talk about import products, and, and it is important that exporter or importer, you know, have same language, can speak English or Spanish, both of them. And then it's really important also to be very clear of what do you want to or who you want to work with if you want to work with and only an importer for the food service service uh, sector or an importer for the retail sector or if you want one importer and distributor that do both because we can find importers that only do retail and importers that only do food service and we can find those that have uh, both sectors and cover both sectors. So, so it's very important for you to take that into consideration and 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 be you know and and have a good idea of, of who you want to work with. Next slide. Now we have the best prospects that Tatiana mentioned uh, at the, uh, at the beginning of the presentation. We can um, see the the poultry. It's uh, a very potential product for our country. Bakery goods, cereals and pasta, beer and wine and spirits, pet food, red meats, including processed, uh, prepared foods, non-alcoholic beverage, processed fruits and vegetables, dairy, chocolate, cocoa, condiments and sauce, sweets and snacks, uh, the portable foods, meat and dairy alternatives, food preparations and ingredients, confectionery, oils, seafood, soft drinks, organic, natural, healthy foods, grains, sausages, and functional beverage. Next slide, please. Uh, the key purchase drivers. Now, after the pandemic, as also Tatiana said about being healthy, now uh, we can see an increase in, in, in functional, healthy, value, price um, products, 
also um, consumers are looking for natural, organic, clean, plant-based, and also focus on wellness. Um, everything that it's a new novel, allergen, it's very important and non-GMO. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, we're going to talk about some of the highlights of consumer trends, um, health conscious and opting to new products, as we said, a smaller pack sizes for those looking to buy less, as well as uh, larger packs for bulk buying that reduce unit prices. In that case, when we said smaller pack sizes, it's because there's also this new trend, you know, uh, people not getting married, but maybe living together. So there's only two people at home and, and their pet. And there's a trend of not having babies as much as they would, you, you know, we were used to. So, so they are looking for smaller pack sizes because it's only two people by family, for instance, and, and most of them millenniums. So, or older people. So that's why, you know, as well as there's big families and Price Mart or Walmart mega stores, you know, it, we also work on the larger packs. Consumers are willing to make the switch to private label due to the balance of quality and price, increased uh, consumer awareness for value-added products, and prefer to purchase at stores, although e-commerce is expanding. Here are some pictures of the activities that we have uh, been doing for food export over the years. You can explain them. These are the pictures of our last um, trade mission in Panama. Uh, we had the market briefing with the FAS team. We uh, also performed a retail tour to the main stores at, uh, at the city. We had the trade res res ah, res reception. reception. And we had some samples and um, uh, some of the exporters cooked at the show. So it was very dynamic for trade. We also try to bring all the exporters to a restaurant on lunch and, and you have to pay on your own. However, we invite the owner of the restaurant that can give us like a, a small, you know, it's a brief on how he purchased. If he do it directly, if he's not doing directly, who is he working with? How's the market in, in the food service? Uh, sector and others so in one of the pictures you will see them the owner of the restaurant giving a brief to the u.s exporters thank you very much all right great thank you so much daniela and tatiana for all the information about the um, costa rican market and the opportunities well, uh, coming up on the trade mission um can you hear me um, I was so excited to get the um, session started earlier. I forgot to mention that, um, as everyone I'm sure already noticed, the uh, lines are automatically muted, but we highly encourage anyone, if they have any questions that come through, there is a Q&A button um, there within Zoom. So go ahead and just click on that button and type in your question. Um, and after um, the portion on Guatemala, we'll go ahead and answer anyone's uh, questions there at the end. Um, but now I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, pass it along to Debbie and Francisco to tell us a little bit more about the trade mission to Guatemala, which takes place immediately after Costa Rica. Thank you, Paul. Hi, everyone. My name is Debbie Corrado. Uh, um, Francisco and I have been uh, serving food export for the last uh, 13 years as in-market representatives, and uh, we appreciate your interest in uh, doing business or the opportunity to do business in Guatemala. Well, I would like to start sharing with you our favorite part of doing a trade mission in Guatemala, and that is the outcomes from the mission. So these success stories, as uh, they have, uh, th th these success stories that I'm 
briefly uh, talked about, uh, represent a tremendous opportunity for the companies to learn from the market and, of course, to take important actions and decisions to do business in Guatemala. And why not uh, include uh, Salvador and Honduras? So these uh, three um, uh, success stories can tell you uh, how the companies have invested their time in coming and doing business and uh, with uh, great um, outcomes. Like Elmhurst um, in the focus tra training mission in 2021 uh, introduced uh, successfully in Honduras the first purchase of uh, uh, more than $5,000. And this has been uh, an ongoing purchase um, since they started doing business. Saint Amite Trade Wines uh, also is successfully introduced in Honduras uh, different uh, varieties of um, uh, wines. And the first purchase was for $16,000. And uh, they have uh, done uh, a little bit um, uh, more since they started. Um, for the, la the last focus transmission, we had a low vine, met a retail. A chain in Guatemala. Their brand is already registered since they um, met during the a focus train mission. And uh, the first order was placed uh, in March 2022 uh, with a total of $150,000. Uh, I can um, next slide, oh, please. Uh, here it's an example of uh, how Elmhurst and the, and the Saint Amand wines are um, showcased in uh, in the supermarket in Honduras. Um, so next, um, so let let us um, tell you a little bit more about the Guatemala market. But I will switch over to Francisco, who can uh, explain you a little bit more. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Debbie. Nice to see you, everyone, here today. So I wanted to start our presentation sharing some details about uh, the Guatemalan market. So we have the largest population in Central America with 17 million inhabitants. Uh, we have the most stable currency uh, in Central America and one of the most stable in the region, along with the Peruvian Sol. We have had the same exchange rate for the past uh, 30 years um, at the moment, uh, $1 is uh, equals 7.85 uh, quetzales. That's the current exchange rate. And we have been the, a good partner with the United States uh, since uh, over 30% of our imported consumer-oriented food products are being uh, directly imported uh, through the United States. So this means the United States is our largest uh, trading partner in the food industry. Next slide, please. Also, we expect an increase by at least 10% uh, in the upcoming years uh, for the retail industry. And we have a, a high advantage, um, let's say a, a, a competitive advantage compared to other regions and countries is that we have uh, both uh, ports in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and low cost transportations uh, to the US thanks to the Proxim. So this is a big advantage uh, considering the high prices that uh, the freights have uh, nowadays. We have seen that Guatemala has been able to, to commit with the imports from the United States thanks to the proximity. Uh, next slide, please. As uh, Tatiana and, and Daniela mentioned, uh, both countries are part of the Dominican uh, Republic and Central America Free Trade Agreement. Uh, this means that 90% of U.S. Uh, agricultural products can be uh, imported as duty-free, and the remaining uh, tariffs will be eliminated in the next three years. And the DR Cata is a top 10 market for U.S. agricultural uh, products with a $4.4 billion in U.S. exports. Next slide, please. Um, as for the retail sector, uh, this industry is highly competitive in, in Guatemala. It has uh, rapidly evolved since the pandemic. Uh, Walmart entered the market not uh, long ago. It was around uh, 10 years. They purchased one of the major uh, retailers in Guatemala. And um, new retail chains have been uh, created in Guatemala. So since the industry is so competitive, uh, 
these chains are finding new ways to 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 stay competitive and to find uh, new consumers. So, for example, uh, private label has become an important strategy. The picture that you see in the slide is a brand called Essentials Every Day. And this brand is uh, owned by one of the main retailers in Guatemala called Unisuper. And they uh, make this brand uh, in the United States. All of the products are US made and they want to replicate the strategy that Walmart used in Guatemala. They were able to combine good quality products with low prices. So private label is one of the main um, categories that we expect to see an important uh, increase in sales in the upcoming years. And also e-commerce since the pandemic started, um, retailers implemented uh, home delivery through websites and apps. And this has become an important uh, sales channel, mainly because in Guatemala City, the traffic is uh, an issue. Uh, during rush hours, it can be very intense, so consumers are finding more alternatives to make their purchase without having to leave their, their house. And for the strategies that I mentioned um, earlier, some companies, uh, for example, are focusing more on implementing more convenience stores in uh, strategic zones inside Guatemala City. And some uh, retailers are focusing on uh, opening new stores in uh, let's say marginal areas or areas that didn't have access to retail stores in the past. So they can attract new consumers uh, to their stores. And for example, Walmart has different store formats depending on their target group. For example, in the um, exclusive zones in Guatemala City, they have their high-end stores. In middle-income zones, they have Walmart, which is like a, a value store. And for low-income consumers, they have uh, there's their own formats where they only sell local products, uh, products that usually have uh, low prices and the store format is totally different compared to, to Walmart or their high-end stores. And the forecast for the retail industry in Guatemala is expected to have an, an important increase as shown in the graph on your right side. We expect over two, uh, two, uh, 215 million quetzales in sales for 2027. Next slide, please. Some of the consumer trends, uh, we have seen new healthier innovations that have been appearing in the market. Uh, for example, uh, the picture in the first side is a high protein uh, ice cream with uh, no sugar and low uh, calories. Then we have a protein yogurt with 20 grams of protein and no other sugar, uh, protein notes, so basically consumers are looking for products that have more health benefits for them. This is a very important trend because consumers are uh, more aware about the, the, the health and looking to find new healthy options and they're willing to pay more if the products have good uh, benefits for them. And this uh, trend started since the pandemic and it's uh, it's been growing since the 2020 until now, the, this trend has state. We have also seen the plant-based beverage uh, category. This category is pretty new in Guatemala. It has no more than uh, eight years that it has become important. Uh, previously, we usually only consume uh, fluid milk, uh, regular cow milk, but this uh, category has become really important and we have been able to experience that uh, different brands, not only local brands, but imported brands are becoming more popular, popular, and we have seen a 12% increase in terms of sales for $2.3 million uh, in this category. Next slide, please. Uh, all, and another important trend is uh, alcoholic drinks, uh, mostly uh, RTDs. Um, this is expected to be the most dynamic categories because consumers are trying to experience new flavors and new alternatives to regular alcoholic drinks, such as wines, beers, and uh, Aperol, I know it's an Italian brand, but this company has uh, recently entered the market and they have been very successful because their flavor is um, very different to the local products or imported products that we currently have available. And same as, uh, as this uh, previous slide that I mentioned, um, consumers are looking for more health benefits or to consume alcoholic drinks without, uh, let's say, with less guilt. So they're looking for low sugar content, low calories, or low alcohol content. 
Uh, also, craft beer has become an important uh, category in, 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 in the retail store, mostly because they offer uh, different and innovative flavors to the traditional brands that we currently have. So the picture you see below Adana Neva is a Costa Rican product that's available in Guatemala, and it's a hard seltzer beverage with no sugar content and low calories. Michelob is a, a low calorie beer and Guzipa is a craft beer imported from the United States. So these are some of the brands that have had uh, most success in, in, in recent years. Next slide, please. Great, thanks Francisco. And I'll just mention, so we, we hit the, um, we're at the, the half hour here. We're gonna continue on because um, we've still got a lot of great information. If anyone has to jump off, I'll just announce, no worries, we're, we are recording this and it's gonna get posted um, on our website as soon as the recording is ready. But we're gonna carry on with the good information and uh, still get to some questions at the end. So um, for the products of interest, they're very similar to, to Costa Rica. You know, we're uh, countries uh, pretty uh, next to each other. So uh, they're pretty much uh, the same, which are beer and wines, spirits, dairy products, sweets and snacks, uh, soft drinks, plant-based beverages, pet food, breakfast cereals, table condiments, craft beers and RTDs, organic and natural food, edible, edible oils and sauces. Next slide, please. And some of the reasons why we encourage you to register to the to this event is that um, US products are preferred over local products as they are perceived as better quality. And we have seen some US products uh, even with lower prices compared to local products, thanks to the DR CAFTA. We have seen some brands that have become um, industry leaders or market share leaders in less than two years because their products have a lower price and a better quality. And this is possible in, in, in Guatemala thanks to the DR CAFTA and the low cost to export the products and, uh, thanks to the proximity. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the lower prices is a key aspect uh, for the US products in, in Guatemala. We have a lot of uh, uh, competitors uh, of imported products such as Italy, uh, South Korea that are trying to make an effort to position their products in, in Guatemala but they can offer a low price due to different, um, let's say factors such as they don't have a free trade agreement or the freight costs. So this is a big advantage for the US products because they are highly positioned as excellent quality products. So this is one of the main reasons why we encourage you to, to participate in the event. Also is that uh, local, uh, the local demand consumer preference and competitions are very much aligned to prefer U.S. products. And uh, the trade facilitation, as I mentioned before, the DR, DR CAFTA and regulatory compliance and logistics are beneficial to do business for uh, Guatemalan importers and U.S. suppliers. Next slide, please. Also, we have smooth logistics and robust supply chain operations. Uh, we're a very small country and the main ports are uh, connected to Guatemala City. So the produce can be uh, easily imported and distributed to, to Guatemala City or the main cities in the country in short time. Also, you get the chance to meet from buyers from three, uh, three countries in the event, but also an important aspect is that Guatemalan companies, most of the importers operate not only in Guatemala, but they have operations in Honduras, El Salvador, or other countries in Central America. So we've seen in the past that US suppliers are able to make a, a business or a sales to, to a Guatemalan importer. And with this same importer, they're able to enter different markets. So that's a big advantage uh, working with Guatemalan companies. Most of them are, um, let's say some of the largest importers in the region and they have a good st economic stability. So this, this is a good opportunity to, to enter uh, not only Guatemala, but the, the Northern Triangle of Central America. And in some cases, they even have operations in, in Panama or other, other regions. So uh, that will be our, our part of the, the presentation. And I believe we, we will start with the Q&A, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Francisco and Debbie and Tatiana and Daniela for all the great information about your markets and um, some really good reasons for U.S. suppliers to join us on these trade missions.
Um, so here's just kind of the overview itinerary. Um, so the missions are back to back. I will say that companies can join just one or the other, but you know we schedule them like this on purpose, of course, so that um, companies can take advantage of the one trip uh, to visit both markets there. But you can find the itineraries also on our website um, as you're uh, taking a look and checking your schedule. Um, so there are a couple of um, deadlines. The early bird registration deadline will be on November 3rd, where you can sign up for um, each mission for $425 each. And then the standard registration deadline will be uh, December 15th to register to get in at uh, $625. And again, information about the event and how you can register is all on our website. Um, the itinerary covers some of the services provided as well as, as our in-market representatives cover them as well. But of course, you know, what's one of the biggest outcomes here is you're going to get the one-on-one -on -one meeting scheduled with qualified buyers while you're in the market. Um, every participant gets a pre-event custom uh, market research report that has market overview, importation and distribution analysis. We're gonna have a market briefing by local foreign agricultural service reps in each country, uh, retail store tour, tabletop showcase. So companies who participate, they kind of walk away as very knowledgeable um, about the markets and you know feel very experienced and, and know everything about the markets as well as having all those one-on-one -on -one meetings and business cards and uh, sales opportunities from their meetings. Uh, where else you can get more information is from your, um, your liaison. So we've got our full liaison contact information here on this page. You can look at uh, based on where your company's headquartered, who is your uh, individual contact, liaison contact that you can reach out to, as well as their um, email address and phone number. We have a number of them on the call here today. So um, any questions that don't get answered, they can also uh, follow up with you directly. All right, with that, let's jump into the uh, questions and answers. Uh, although, uh, Tatiana, do you have um, something to add? Yes, yeah, thank you. In the case of Costa Rica, on during our one-on-one -on -one meetings, we're not having one-on-one -on -one meetings in a hotel. What we do is we take the U.S. exporters uh, with a translator, if needed, and a, a, a private a car to the company they're meeting with. So they can meet with the manager in their offices and see the facilities also. All right, great, just, thank you. Just that detail, thank you. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, Debbie and Francisco, your meetings would be similar to that or would they be the meetings take place at a hotel? Uh, they take place at the, the hotel. Yeah, the, the, the buyers come to the hotel for the, for the things. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'm going to jump into the questions that we have from the audience. So the first one's about labeling requirements. Um, so maybe we can start with um, Tatiana and Daniela, and then we'll go on to Debbie and Francisco. But the question is, what are the labeling requirements? Do I need Spanish or Spanish and English labels? Can I send my English only packaging to the markets or would Spanish labeling give me a competitive advantage? Well, by law, the label should be in Spanish. Could be Spanish English if she wanna have both, but has to be translated into Spanish from the maximum ingredient to the minimum ingredient. And you can add a label. You don't have to change the package it's not needed to change. You can add a Spanish label. Yeah, it's um, it's the same in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Um, there is no need for the companies to change the packaging. However, uh, it's mandatory to uh, stick a label in Spanish with the main uh, information about the product ingredients. Uh, importer information, um, and that information, of course, has to be in Spanish. All right, great. Thank you both. Um, the next question is about the cost of the trade mission. So um, I'll just kind of reiterate, it's $425 for each mission if you get in at the early registration deadline, which is in November. Um, as far as cost, um, cost assistance, if 
companies are eligible for our branded program. And if you're not familiar with our branded program, you can certainly reach out to your liaison, but that's our 50% reimbursement program for small businesses. If companies are eligible for that, then travel costs to go down to these missions for up to two company representatives would be eligible through that program for 50% reimbursement. So that's flights, hotels, and meals and incidentals. So if you're not familiar with branded program, please reach out to your liaison um, and these trade missions would be eligible for your, for your travel costs. Um, all right, the next question is, is there any interest for all natural grass-fed beef uh, grown and raised in Kansas, or I'll say in the Midwest or Northeast um, in either of these countries? How about any interest for, for beef? And pay, uh, perhaps in particular, all natural grass-fed. Should I start? Yeah, go ahead, Tatiana. Thank you. Uh, yes, there is an interest, and and there is actually some of of those in the high end supermarkets already. Frozen, frozen, all of them. Go go ahead, Francisco. If you have anything to add. Oh yeah, same as in Guatemala. We have some of those uh, products available, but yeah, that's an important category in both retail and food service. Okay, great. Um, okay, the next question is about um, kind of traveling and, and how many meetings. So if the Costa Rica meetings are in the buyer's location, so factoring in travel times, the question is how many meetings roughly could each uh, participant anticipate? I know it always depends on the product type, but go ahead, Tatiana. Mm -hmm. Well, we we try to have at least five minutes a day. So so you know four to five minutes a day. It depends on so in traffic and how far it is, but it's around ten minutes in total. Ten to twelve. Ten to twelve, because we can do also lunches with with them, you know. And regarding, uh, well, that's that's the meetings. Then regarding the sampling is the same, you know, same amount depending on how many products they're bringing or how many uh, you, like flowers of their product, their flavors they're bringing, sorry, the flavors, mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's different for each product. Okay, that's great, that makes sense. And then for Guatemala, um, means are at the hotel, uh, but would you say roughly the same, each participant would get maybe around 10 meetings? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, all right, the, the questions are coming in, which is great. Um, how about, um, I'm gonna Price. jump over that one. There, there was a question about label translation and compliance. Um, we don't offer that. We're not gonna have a speaker come and talk about label translation, right? But we can make recommendations to companies on as far as like vendors they could reach out to. Yes, we can do yes. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes we do have an on on labeling and also uh, import um, import uh, requirements requirements and in project, the country. And we already talked to a couple and see if they want to come for free <laughs> and talk about. Uh, and if they speak English, if not, we will have to hire a translator. But yes, we're trying to have that in the briefing. And we usually have one person in doing that for 30 minutes or so, in our case. Great. Um, okay, we've got three questions left, so we'll, we'll finish up with these three. Um, how much product should each participant plan to bring for the mission as far as you know, demoing and, and showing samples, maybe leaving some samples behind? Well, uh, there is a minimum of uh, products when you were talking about samples, you know, and we were, you know, Debbie was saying it, that they were going to import it as, con as, if, as, as consumption, personal consumption. But we will have to see first the product, how many flavors they're bringing of each product, if they want to have tasting in, during the, the reception. 
and and depending on that we can give them you know the total amount permitted also i know about you know in past emissions us exporters bring in some of the products in their suitcases because they can do that also and and you know we're talking about 10 20 pieces at most and and that's also something they can think of, of doing it but it really depends on the products yeah, totally agree with uh, Tatiana. It's the same in Guatemala. It depends on the product you want to introduce to the market, um, and because there are some uh, regulations in um, in exporting or importing in this case uh, samples, so we don't want to um, um, receive more than uh, more than the allowed uh, weight. Uh, for per company, but um, but again, it depends on the on the product and the that you want to to promote. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, and this one might be might be dependent on each company and and maybe their own individual policies. But the question is about having pricing figured out. Um, I guess. Do you do you guys have a recommendation on whether a company should come with with kind of some fixed pricing in mind, or should they come, you know, sort of ready to to sort of do pricing based on negotiation? Well, I think sometimes you know they bring the prices, but then when they're negotiating, they you know it's 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 different depending on on volume. It's very important to be conscious that. Central American countries are small compared to China, compared to Europe, European countries, and the qu the quantity of the of the first imports are going to be you know smaller or pallets or boxes, and not yet containers, and and so so you know and I know that that make price really expensive at some point, but you if if you can bring both you know and be Conscious that when negotiating the price, maybe you can ha have to lower it a little, you know, that would be great. Sometimes it's better to have the price list and sometimes it depends. But, but you know, when, when after, after those meetings, sometimes their exporters are, you know, saying that they will send the price list and within two weeks and sometimes it takes longer because they have other missions and things and and so if you can bring the price i think that will always help thank you um similar any anything to add or does that sound about right also for debbie and francisco okay all right we'll get to the last question that is do um the manufacturing plants for the US products that are going there need to be registered with both countries before they can start doing business there? Or is, is there no kind of manufacturing facility registration required? Well, yes, it depends if it's a meat a factory or it's a cheese factory. Yes, they will have to be registered before doing business. You know, not for the samples, but to do the business, yes. And if they're registered already, it's going to be easier to bring the samples, of course, you know. Yeah, um, just, you know, the regulations uh, in Central America are similar. So what uh, probably is um, a requirement for Costa Rica, uh, Panama is the same and Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras. So. Um, there is no, it depends on the product. There are some uh, um, facilities or manufacturing plants that that don't need to be registered, but it depends on the on the product and the ingredients they uh, they work with. All right, great. Well, thank you, thank you all very much. Um, in person or slash virtual round of applause for our in-market representatives uh, for the excellent information this afternoon. Um, I know we're really excited about these two back-to-back -back trade missions. We hope this uh, information was helpful as companies make the decision um, to join us next March. So 
with that, we'll wrap up and, and thank you again to, to our speakers. And um, I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. See you then. Thanks. Thank you.